started out this morning, if you'll turn your Bible to uh, Genesis 3. While you're turning there, I just want to share something with you. I, um, I know some of you guys are visiting here with us today, and um, I know it, may, it might not be the most professional thing uh, for people to do, but I will tell you, I, I am going to be emotional throughout this service. Um, what I'm doing is not for show. Um, it's just for gratitude. When you hear that song, we could have stopped, stopped the service just to know what Christ did for us. I'm not worthy. Paul said in Scripture, he, he wasn't worthy. He called himself the chief of sinners. And many of us in this room, we need to hear today's message. And... That's for different people. Many of us are going through different things in our life. And we need to be reminded sometimes, even for those of us who have been in church for many years, who've been saved, oftentimes we need to be reminded of what Christ did for us on Calvary's cross. Because what happens a lot of times is, you know, there's people in this room today who they've never committed their life to Christ. And some of you, that might even be some of you guys who have been in churches for, for many years. And you know deep down you've never committed your life to Christ. You've never given God control of your life. You've never made Him, as that song said, your master. That's what salvation is about. And you've just been going through the motions, serving in ministry. But you know deep down that if you died today and you stood before Christ, that He would look at you and say, depart from me, I never knew you. And there's some of you guys in here today. There's some of you guys you might be in church for the very first time. And when you see us get emotional, when you see us get teary-eyed to talk about what our Savior did on the cross for you and for I, and I'm going to explain that in detail uh, today. And I know that there's some, and I kind of put out some of these emails this week. I know there's some of us who have been in church for so long, and we have given God control of our life, but what has happened is the busyness of ministry has taken over. And what we do is we come here and all it is, it's not ministry, it's a program. And all we're doing is coming here and going through the motions, doing whatever it is we have to do. But deep down, you're dying inside because something has caused that connection that you had with Christ to start to disconnect. That you're starting to get a little bit farther away. And there's some of you guys in this congregation today that you are a Christian, but yet you've fallen so far off course. Whatever it is, whatever sin has begun to overtake your life, you're just starting to fall completely apart. Every time you pick up your Bible, you just know passion. Anytime you sit in the church, the first thing that you think about is, when can I get out of here? And I want to tell you that no matter where you are today, this message is for you. And I want to let everybody know before we even start at the end of this message, there will be an altar call, okay? And all that altar call simply for is to give you a chance to respond. And when I say that, there's no pressure before we go, no pressure for anybody to come up here. But I tell you what the importance of people coming for an altar call is for you to publicly stand and say, guess what, you're not perfect. But there was one man who was perfect and can give you a life, give you a new name, unlike anything you've ever imagined. And his name is Jesus Christ. And if it takes you to just have to Put your pride down and to stand up and come to this altar, big deal. So I want to encourage you, nobody's going to know why you're coming here, okay? There'll be people at this altar to pray with you. Nobody knows why you're coming. But I just want to give you that heads up that that will be taking place. All right, so I want to read a passage of Scripture because this is where I was. And some of you guys might be here uh, in this same condition. But years ago, as, as many of you guys know, I'm going to share just really briefly. I was raised as a pastor's kid. I knew, I understand, I heard all this stuff, as Miss Bonnie's song, Miss Bonnie's song said, I, I heard all that stuff, I knew all that stuff, but yet it didn't take fruit into my life, it didn't take root, nothing, no change, nothing took place in my life, and then I joined the Marine Corps, and as anybody knows, anybody in here a Marine, or, you know, because once a Marine, always a Marine, we just, okay, I got a few, 
They've got a t-shirt that says, not as lean, not as green, but still a Marine, okay? So that is definitely me. But I went, when I joined the Marine Corps, and I, I go to combat. I go to uh, the war in Iraq in 2003 in the very beginning. And when I get back, and, you know, a few years later, you know, God just got a hold of me and just wrecked my life. And now when I look back, I look back at how foolish I was. Here I was a preacher's kid in a combat zone, and I had no clue. I could not give you a guarantee that if I got killed in that combat zone, if I would have went to heaven or hell. I can't tell you I had assurance of my faith. Not at all. Not at all. It wasn't until I was 27 years old that I knew that I had assurance of my faith. But you want me to tell you something? You might know somebody that's a Marine. You cannot tell a hard-headed Marine that they're not going to live to be 90 years old. You can't. They live their life recklessly. And that happens to a lot of us, even our younger age. We feel like, you know, God says this to me. God's speaking to me. But I could put off as long as I want to this decision to live for Christ. And you tell yourself, when before I die, I will make that decision for Jesus Christ. Let me tell you guys something. There are a lot of people who die every single day that never had that chance. And I want to share just before you, before I read this quote, uh, God only has to give you one chance, folks. I know you've heard me say it before, but only one chance. And when I talk about even you guys who are believers in Jesus Christ, if you are falling away from God, there is a scripture, and you guys have heard me say this before, that just eats me up inside. It really puts a lot of fear. Is when Jesus says, but people will say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and we casted out demons. And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. So you know what that tells me? There's a lot of Christians, there's a lot of preachers who are dying and going to hell. They're going through the motions and never gave God control of their lives. But I want to share this with you. Because just, just this quote. It's not up here. I just got it this morning as I was preparing um, for the message. And uh, Jonathan Edwards uh, was a dynamic pastor or preacher. And he had a sermon that some of you guys are familiar with called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And when he preached this sermon, they said so many people came to know Christ that people were clinging the tent poles, sticking in the middle of the tent, screaming, begging for God to forgive them for their sins. And one of the quotes that he said in there, I want to just say this to you. I want everybody to pay attention. Please don't worry about your phone. The reason why I say this, don't worry about dinner. Don't worry about anything else. The reason why I say this is this could be your chance for an eternal destiny. Okay? And if you just blow it off, this could be the last chance. And this is what I'm going to share. This is what he said. He said, it is no security to wicked man for one moment that there are no visible means of death at hand. It is no security to a natural man that he is now in health and that he does not see which way he should now immediately go out of the world by any accident and that there is no visible danger in any respect in his circumstances. You know what that means? Nobody's promised tomorrow. You're not promised the next hour, okay? And that's what I wanted to share with you. That goes from young to old. So please, everybody, pay attention. Looking at your Bible, we're going to go ahead and start Genesis 3, starting at verse 6 and 7. This is not the main passage of Scripture for today, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to walk you through why the cross of Jesus Christ was necessary. Why did Jesus Christ have to leave His throne in heaven, come to this earth, live a life, and die on the cross? Why did that have to take place? All right, we see at the very beginning why we even needed a sacrifice. Genesis 3, verse 6 and 7 says this, Then the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. This is the problem here. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. So what you see here in this instant, you have Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Everything was perfect. Everything was fine. The stuff you've been promised about, about heaven, but there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more sorrow. That was taking place in the Garden of Eden. What happened is Adam and Eve decided to disobey God. What happened is the devil appeared in the form of a snake and he'd started manipulating the Word of God. And many of you guys are very familiar with what manipulating the Word of God looks like because the devil starts manipulating that Word in your head. He starts telling you things that are not true. One of those things is you don't have to accept Christ. You can do that when you get old. Okay? 
That's one of those lies. But what happened here, the worst decision in human history was made. Humanity through Adam and Eve chose to rebel against God to become their own God by obeying their own sinful desires. And I'm going to show you here in just a second that that is true of every single one of us. Every single one of us is just as guilty as Adam and Eve. The first time you lied to your parents, the first time you hit your brother or sister, the first time you stole that cookie when your mom said, don't eat that cookie, you sinned. Sin entered your life. You are born with a sin nature. And I'm going to show you that here in a second. But sin entered the world through Adam, the Bible says. In Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, I just showed you that, and death through that sin, in this way death spread to all people because guess what? All has sinned, okay? Through his this first sin, we see that the world would never be the same. Sin brought with it. And this is what I want you guys to understand. I need everybody to pay attention. You young people over there, quit talking, okay? I want to tell you something, okay? This is why I'm not trying to be rude. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I don't want anybody to be distracted. I want you to understand something. Sin, when it entered the world, brought all the nastiness with it. The things that we blame God for, the things that we get upset for, was all because that we decided to disobey God. So when you get diagnosed with cancer, when your financial crisis, all this stuff takes place, all right? When your kids get sick, when bad things happen, that is because of us, not because of God. What God wanted for you was that perfect world in the Garden of Eden. That's what God wanted for you. But when you and I decided to disobey God and be God of our own lives, guess what happened? All this nastiness came into the world. Some of the things such as death, murder, hatred, cancer, drunkenness, adultery, and all other kinds of sins entered the world when Adam and Eve sinned. And we continue that process because we all sin every single day. Every one of us, to include myself, and I say that because I want everybody to hear, and I want you to know this, we all sin. And I'm going to show you how Scripture tells us that here in just a second. But this problem of sin affects you from birth. No matter what you do, when you have that sweet little innocent baby, and I want you to think as parents and grandparents, when that baby first comes in the world, there's nothing greater, right? There's no greater experience. But you know that eventually that baby's going to do something wrong. The reason why is because every person born into this world is born into sin. There is not one baby born as beautiful and perfect as they might look that they're not going to break your heart. That they're not going to disobey you. That they're not going to disrespect you. The reason why is because every single one of us is born into sin. What that means is it doesn't matter what you try to do in your life. It doesn't matter how good you try to be. What that means is you are a sinner. And there's only one way for you to be made right before God that so that you can have this Garden of Eden experience that Adam and Eve had. It says the problem of sin affects us from birth. Every man or woman is born into sin, which means that not one person is capable of living a life free of sin. David, when he confessed his sin, and I want to share this with you because some of you guys, you might be thinking to yourself because this is the lie I told myself. You might be thinking, I have done too much for God to forgive me. You're getting ready to hear something that a man who just committed adultery and committed murder. He was the king of Israel, and guess what? He tried to hide his sin for a whole year. And right now, you're getting ready to see his public profession. This is what he said. He said, indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. That's what this man says. And if you finish that train of thought here in Psalm 51, guess what? David talks about this beautiful forgiveness that's in God. And not only does he have forgiveness of sin, but guess what? All the guilt and shame went away with it as well. And I say that to encourage you because I know some of you, you got that guilt, you got that shame. It's weighing you down so heavy, making you think to yourself, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing that I could do to be found in the grace of God. Billy Graham said the seed of sin is in us when we are born. Everyone in this room today has sinned. Not one of us can look into our lives and say that we have no sin. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the reason why I want to share that, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter how much you helped your grandma when you were growing up. It doesn't matter how many times you go to ShopRite and the little old lady asks you to grab something off the top shelf 
like they do re religiously with me, okay? It doesn't matter how many times you do that. Because what happens is when you stand before Jesus at your death, and I guarantee you that's going to take place. The Bible tells us it will. It says that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So you will stand before Jesus. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So you'll be standing before Jesus and you're going to have to let Jesus know why you should get into heaven. But one thing you can't tell Jesus is I was such a great person. Because if you heard me say it countless times, and I'll say it countless times again, I could care less if you get mad that I keep saying it over and over again. But good people die and go to hell every day. Good people die and go to hell every day. And I don't want to talk about hell to scare people, but you've heard it said many, many times, one minute everybody dies and goes to hell. One minute. One minute everybody dies and goes to hell because they were too stubborn to accept the gift that God has for you and I. They did not recognize that we're all sinners. Also in 1 John 1, it says, if we say we have no sin, this is some of us in here today as Christians, if we say we have no sin, guess what John says? We are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we sit here today and say we do not sin, the truth is not in us. We're deceiving ourselves. And you want to know how that looks like the most? You might not publicly say this. I tell this to the teenagers all the time. You want to know how that verse lives its way out? Because some of you guys in your head right now are thinking, oh man, I wish so-and-so was here to hear this verse, to hear this sermon. Oh man, so-and-so could really get a lot out of this, right? Guess what you're doing? You're living your life in your own mind saying I'm without sin. So and so is worse off than I am. And that's a lie. Okay? We all have sinned. The problem of sin is in every person's life. It explains why we need a sacrifice. So I want you all to understand and see this right now, just from this very beginning. You know why you needed a sacrifice that Jesus gave. Why? Because what? We're all sinners, right? We're all sinners in need of a sacrifice. Sin had entered the world and humanity needed to be reconciled with God. So the first thing I want to show you is that you can't be saved by obeying rules. You teenagers and young adults in here, this is one I really, I mean, it plagues us all, but I want you young people to really hear this. Many of you think that just because if you abstain from sex to marriage, you don't drink, you don't do drugs, you don't smoke, you help out your mom and dad, you are the best kid in the world and you're going to heaven. Because what has happened is the church has allowed you to think that that's what it means to be a Christian. And I'm here to tell you, folks, no matter how old you are, it does not matter what type of rules you follow. That doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is complete surrender to Jesus Christ to where you can get to the point to say, you're my master. You're my Lord. When you finally admit, I'm not Lord of my life, he is. That's what salvation is. It says in Galatians 3, 10 through 11, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse because it is written, everyone who does not do everything, I want you to hear that, everyone who does not do everything written in the book of the law is cursed. Now it is clear that no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. By simply abiding, and I want you to hear this, by simply abiding by Old Testament law, by abiding by the Ten Commandments, by being this perfect little person, Guess what? You can't be saved because guess what I just read to you in Galatians 3? The law demands what? Perfection. And none of you guys in here are perfect. Somebody tell me, raise your hand if you've never sinned before. If you've never broke one of the Ten Commandments. So guess what I just told you? It does not matter how many of those commandments you hold. It's, it's sad because we see so many people in our communities, in the Jewish community, who live their way trying to be perfect in the law. And what does Paul say? Nobody can be perfect. Nobody can completely feel that law. So the Bible says that if you cannot fulfill and be perfect in obeying the law, guess what? You're under a curse. You want me to tell you what that curse is? It's death. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death. So the curse that falls upon every single one of us when you sin is the curse of death. The curse of death. Because the law cannot save you because the law demands perfection. Also, good deeds cannot save you. Isaiah 64, 6 says, All of us have become like something unclean. And all of our righteous acts are like a polluted garment. Some of you have heard that verse before where it says all of our acts are like dirty rags. 
like dirty rags. All of us wither like a leaf and our iniquities carry us away like the wind. This is to you believers. This is the verse I want you to hear right now. It does not matter if you're getting just pulled away from God because the busyness of ministry. If you're backsliding and falling away from God, this is a verse you need to hear. It doesn't matter how many times you come and you collect this money. It doesn't matter how many times you come and you vacuum this floor and you clean the toilets. It doesn't matter how many kids you minister to. It, none of that matters. Because what does the Bible say? It is all like what? Filthy rags. Nothing you do can earn the salvation that God gives us. Nothing. It does not matter how much you serve in the church. It doesn't help you. After the rich young ruler walked away from Christ, Pastor Ken shared that sermon a couple months ago, walked away from Christ and Jesus spoke on how hard it was for a rich man to enter into to heaven. His disciples were puzzled. It tells us about that in Matthew 19, 25 through 26 when his disciples, it says the disciples were astonished. Then who in the world can be saved? Jesus just said that this man who had absolutely everything but could not forsake it to call Jesus his Lord, to follow after Jesus with reckless abandonment. Okay? He's unable to do it. Then Jesus says how hard it is for rich men to get into heaven. Guess what? The disciples were asking what all of us are asking. What in the world can anybody do to be saved? Jesus looked at them intently, and this is where this verse is often taken out of context. But this is the way it really should be read. Dealing with salvation, Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, what? All things are possible. You can't get to heaven, folks, on your own. No matter what you've done, no matter how old you are, no matter how grievous your sin, I know some of you guys in this church, I know you've come and you've talked to me. You're serving in ministry. You're doing these things. And there's some grievous sin in your life. Maybe there's some grievous sin in your past that you've asked God to forgiveness, but you can't forgive yourself. Please know about that. that it's, I know my brother Bill Lloyd out here, he likes to talk about this, me, him, and Dave Becker. But there's victory in Jesus. There's victory by the way of the cross. And it doesn't matter what you've done. God will forgive you. And He'll wipe that slate clean. He'll take that guilt and that shame and throw it away. And He'll give you a new name. So know that nothing you do can earn it. But with God, everything is possible. Humanity, that's us. We're incapable of earning our salvation. God set parameters for how sin could be forgiven. In the Old Testament law, blood was required to be shed for the forgiveness of sins. What that meant is a life had to be forgiven. Sin was required for, or blood was required for sin to be forgiven, and a death had to take place for that blood to be shed. You see that in the Old Testament through Old Testament animal sacrifices. It tells us in Genesis 3.21, we see the very first time this took place. I just showed you Adam and Eve, when they sinned, what did they realize? They were naked. They finally realized what sin was all about. They realized they were naked. So when God comes down in the cool of the evening, the Bible says in the cool of the evening, God walked with Adam and Eve. So God knew where they were. But what did God do? God came into the garden and He started calling out to Adam and Eve. The same way He's calling out to some of you guys now. And they did exactly what you tried to do. They tried to hide. And they're hiding from God. And then when they find God just knows where they are, they start communicating. They say that they're naked. And God says, who told you you were naked? But we see the instance of a loving God because He takes the life of something to cover our mistakes. And He took in Genesis 3.21, He took the, the skin from an animal. It says, and the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. So the question is, how can man be saved? Just like those disciples ask, how can man be saved? The answer explains, the answer to that question explains why the cross was needed. Jesus came to be our salvation. When John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, when he saw Jesus approaching, you know what he said? When Jesus was coming to be baptized for him, in 1 John 1.29b, he says, look, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. 
Jesus himself testified that he came to save us. He said that his death would be the only way for salvation. Do you hear that, folks? Hear me today. Jesus proclaimed, I am the only way to salvation. It says in Matthew 20, verse 20, or he said, he said that his death would be the only way for salvation. In Matthew 20, 28, he said that he must come to do what? To give his life as a ransom for many. Guess who those many are? Me and you. This is why God sent Jesus. 1 John 4, 14 says, And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent His Son as what? As the world's Savior. You're not your own Savior, folks. There's only one Savior that came. And His name is Jesus Christ. So your question might be, why is Jesus the only way? Because for sins to be forgiven in the Old Testament, that sacrifice had to be perfect and without blemish. Nothing mistake on that sacrifice that had to be made. During the first Passover is where you see this in Egypt. The Israelites had to select the perfect animal for the death angel to pass over their home. Exodus 25a says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. Let me tell you guys something. Jesus was our perfect lamb. He never once sinned. The Bible testifies to this in several places. 1 Peter 2.22 says, He never sinned, nor did He ever deceive anyone. 1 Peter 1.19 says, It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. For our sins to be forgiven, folks, we must have, we must have a sinless sacrifice. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Do you hear that? So that we could be made right through Christ. Guess what takes place? Jesus Christ lived that sinless life and He was the sacrifice that we needed. Because of nothing that we do, all because of Jesus Christ, He came simply to be that sacrifice so that you could be made right with God. Look at me in the eyes. To be made right with God, guess what that means? That when you die from this earth, if you've been made right with God and surrendered your life to Christ, guess what? That means when you open your eyes, you're standing before your Savior. The Bible says precious is the death of the saints in the eyes of the Lord. And when you open your eyes and you stand before your Master, and there's a picture that's going around on Facebook. I wish I had it. Some of you guys might have seen it. It's, a, it's an image of Jesus embracing a woman. Have you seen that painting? And it says it's her arrival in the heaven. If you know Christ, if you've given Christ control of your life, that's what it will look like for you. Jesus will embrace you. He'll look at you like Jamie said, that you suffered. You went through hardship on this earth because guess what? Jesus never said it was going to be easy. But He's going to look at you and He's going to say, well done. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And you'll enter into heaven. But the other people here that you don't know Jesus there's another scenario for you. Jesus will look at you and say, depart from me, I never knew you. We never had a relationship. Please, everybody hear me in this. If you don't hear anything else, please hear this. The minute you hear Christ say that, it's over. There's no more forgiveness at the throne of God when you're standing there being judged. And as the demons of hell come to drag you to hell, you will, as the Bible say, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But at that point, it's too late. But you want me to tell you something? Right now, it's not too late. Right now, it's not too late. It says Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice that finally gave mankind a chance to be reconciled to God. This is, this is why we needed that sacrifice. This is why we can't be saved by obeying the law. This is why we can't earn our salvation. This is why Jesus came and this is why Jesus is the only way. It boils down to one thing and that's love. God sent Jesus because He loves you. Jesus died, guess what? Because He loves you. Jesus died because He loves you and you can have a new life today because you are loved. Billy Graham said God proved His love on the cross when Christ hung and bled and died. It was saying to the world, I love you. The greatest love story ever told. Even though you might not have a relationship with God today, please know that Jesus, He took your place. 
As Miss Bonnie sang in that song, it was our nails. It was our crown of thorns that He took. 1 Peter 2.24 says He personally carried our sin in His body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By His wounds we are healed. So this message today can speak to many of us. Those who have never made Jesus Lord of our life. Those who have been saved but are falling away. And those who have become so preoccupied with the business of ministry that we've neglected our loving union with God. All of this sin and the spiritual neglect can be forgiven. Hear this part. The shame can be gone. The guilt can be gone. The burden can be gone. No matter who you are or what you've done, Jesus is calling. And all of that can be gone because me and my brother Bill, we get so excited because there's victory in Jesus Christ. Come just as you are today, broken, scarred, tormented. And guess what? He'll give you a new life. A better life. A promised hope of eternal life. The newsboys, this message just got pressed on my heart. Please, guys, just, I know it's getting late, but don't worry about time. Let's just worry about the Holy Spirit. When we win, as Brian had that beautiful slideshow, when I heard the newsboys sing a song is when this message started brewing in my head. They have a song that says, the cross has the final word. But what does that mean to us? It means that no matter what you've done or what you're doing now, there's freedom. Complete freedom is only found at the cross. As it says in Acts 4.12, only Jesus has the power to save. His name is the only one in all the world that can save anyone. I want to say something. We're getting ready to show a video. This is what I want everybody to do as you're listening to this video, as you're listening to this song. I want you to look inside of yourself. Are you one of those three people? Have you never given control of your life to Jesus Christ? Guys, please try not to get stuff moving and because that distracts people. Are you one of those people who have never given control of your life to Christ? Come find your freedom. Are you one of those ones who are falling away from God? You're backsliding. You're not where you used to be. Come and recommit your life to Christ. You're one of those people that just like me when I read about the busyness of ministry, that we're too much like Martha and we don't spend enough married time at the feet of Jesus. If that's you, come and ask forgiveness of Christ. Listen to the words that Billy Graham's going to share, then the words of this song, and then we'll have our altar call. Please play. Well, I want you to think a moment and look at that cross. It was the most cruel of all punishments because the victims sometimes would hang there for several days. It took them several days to die. And on this occasion, they were crucifying three people. Two thieves, murderers, and Jesus in the middle. The soldiers entered the guardhouse and brought Jesus with the two other condemned men. They were beaten 33 times or 39 times on their bare backs with leather thongs with steel pellets on the end. A crown of thorns had been put on Jesus' brow. A cross was laid upon his back. The procession started. Jerusalem was filled with a carnival-like atmosphere at that time. And the procession went through the main street so that all might see that the criminal and be warned of a similar fate if he broke the laws of Rome. A big crowd was following. Just a few of Jesus' friends were following. And Jesus became weakened by the loss of blood and he fell. And so Simon of Cyrene, an African, helped him carry the cross. The soldiers went quickly and methodically about their task of driving home the nails in his hands and the spike through his feet. The crowd mills around jeering. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. They laughed and they mocked and they made fun of him. Come down. Do just one more miracle, they said. But he didn't do it. He stayed there. And you know why he stayed there? Because of you because he loved you because you see only in Jesus Christ can we find forgiveness of sins he was bearing our sins on the cross